Hey, my name's Alex and welcome to Alex Listens. This is the place where I talk about things like philosophy and politics and identity and race and mental health and that kind of stuff. So you might be wondering, what is Alex Listens? Well, it's a project on those things that I just listed and it takes three forms. There is this form, the video form, videos posted on YouTube. Then there is the podcast, which is on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and wherever you find your podcasts. And then there is my website, which I guess I post some other blogs and information related to my interviews and to my videos. And my website is www.alex.co. So today, I had a conversation with Shahar Avin, who is a senior research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge. Now, that's a pretty ominous name, right? The Center for the Study of Existential Risk. But this conversation actually sketched a pretty hopeful narrative. Um, we, we had a wide-ranging conversation from Shahar's very complex and sophisticated kind of life trajectory from doing an undergrad at Cambridge to being a software engineer at Google to then finally working on, the, working on these big ethical questions about existential risk at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Um, we also spoke about you know, the threat of impending things, and I guess that's what existential risk is. It is the evaluation of things that pose a threat to the well-being or the existence of our species or of our planet. So we spoke about things like cybersecurity and cyber attacks, and, you know, trying to understand what it means when you buy an iPhone and, you know, you accept the, their privacy terms and conditions and what it means to actually have a smartphone and what it means to have an online identity in this world of very confusing and very sophisticated algorithms. We also spoke about the relationship between the university, the tertiary institution, and the general public, because often it's the university that is doing a lot of research into these big ethical questions that are arising from developments in AI, and often, you know, these developments in artificial intelligence and in technology are happening at a much quicker rate than the research that, you know, is following them. Um, so we spoke about that, and we spoke about the responsibility of educators and of professors um, in their duty to the public to, you know, kind of disseminate information in a way that is accessible to people who don't have a background in artificial intelligence or in tech or that kind of stuff. The conversation was an overview of the landscape of existential risk. Shahar's area of focus is short to near-term risks, so I guess that's what we mostly focused on. Um, so yeah, it's a wonderful conversation, and Shahar is one of the most patient and thorough and detailed and thoughtful people that I've interviewed on the podcast, so please enjoy the video. But before I begin, if you're enjoying Alex Listens or anything else that I do, be sure to support it. You can do so in a number of ways. There's a link below to Patreon, which is a great platform. You just click a few buttons and then, you know, that will ensure that I'm able to keep doing this. Um, there's PayPal, or just follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook, on Instagram, or you can just go on my website and find it all in one place. Anyway, links below. Enjoy the video. Bye. So hi, Shahar, thank you. Thank you for coming onto the podcast. A pleasure. Um, Okay, so I guess one thing that I'm not very good at doing, which I should really do more often, is getting people to introduce themselves. Um, so I suppose for an audience who doesn't really know uh, that much about you, apart from what I've told them, which isn't that much, um, how would you introduce yourself? And who are you, I suppose? Sure. So the, uh, the, the tagline, the my job right now um, there is a center at the university of cambridge in the uk um, that is the center for the study of existential risk uh, which is a fancy name to say we try and figure out what is going to kill everyone actually everyone everyone or merely leads to a giant catastrophe global collapse type thing you think like maybe covid is like on the smallest end of things that we might start considering relevant to our work. Uh, usually we think about things that are bigger than that. Um, 
and I'm a researcher in that center. I have been there for the last five years. Um, prior to that, I had a meandering path through, um, grew up in Israel, did a military service, came to the UK to do my undergraduate, did physics, switched from physics to philosophy of science, stayed to do a PhD, uh, decided academia was hopeless, went and became a software engineer for a while, and then this center came up and I figured this might actually be what I was looking for in academia all along, which is somewhere uh, aiming for impact. Um, mm. so it feels very pretentious to say that. But that's generally what we try to do. Mm. And how, how has, because I've also, um, I, I've also jumped between a number of different fields. Like for a long time, I wanted to do medicine and then I started, I did, two and a half years of a law degree. And then I kind of had this big crisis and realized that I had no idea what I was interested in. And so I decided to do philosophy, of course. Um, and yeah, I think I, one of my concerns is that uh, academic philosophy se seems to have a negligible impact on the world outside of the institution. And I think the Center for the Study of the Existential Risk at uh, Cambridge and what's the one at Oxford called again? Um, the Future of Humanity Institute. Yeah, I, yeah, the Future of Humanity Institute. Those seem to be one of the two of the few um, kind of extensions of philosophy that have, you know, that are kind of doing some kind of practical ethics, which seems to be very interesting. So, yeah, what's what's that been like for you? What's it been like? working for, I don't even know what to call it, an organization, a think tank, I'm not really sure what it is, but what's it like being working for something that, you know, is trying to answer the question of what do we do when something is <laughs> so menacing that, you know, it, it, it may wipe out our species? Um, what, what's that like? Yeah. Um, so of course, on the day-to-day, -day, right, you don't experience the whole thing. You just experience the set of emails in your inbox and the next meeting that you yeah. have to go to. But stepping back, I think the biggest thing is that it's really interesting. It's a really interesting topic. And for how interesting and important it is, surprising how neglected it is, how little work there has been on various deals. Not nothing. And the more we spend, the more we uncover bits and pieces in various corners of academia. Um, but I think that, so there are many things you can do in the center. There are many things that we do do in the center because there are many facets to this problem. Once you start thinking of the world, not in terms of disciplines, but in terms of problems and how do you mix disciplines to try and solve these problems, I think you get a lot more excited about doing research and related work. Uh, I really like um, uh, Arizona State University, for example, because they've kind of reconfigured their entire university to go in that direction. I think mm. Caesar is a tiny example of how you can do these things within more established uh, universities, is try and create topic or problem-focused research centers. And I think we have more traditional philosophers who think about applied ethics, kind of the, the consequences of, of generally everyone dying and what does it mean from different perspectives. I have taken a slightly different route, which is um, I think philosophers are very but really philosophers of X, say philosophers of science, because they've already have some experience in looking at the field from the outside and trying to understand the underlying assumptions and why some debates persist and so on, they are fairly good at convening conversations that are multidisciplinary. A lot of what I have done at CISA has been of that nature, is right. try to find a problem that is relevant to the question of how we are going to die and how we might stop it, in to get people in the room who have the right expertise, but who don't usually spend any time on this problem and get them to talk to each other and ask, answer some naive questions. Uh, I think philosophy has been pretty useful for that. Hmm. Okay. Um, because yeah, I, I think uh, the, the center that the center um, that you work at has people from, it seems like people from every discipline um which you know that's that's uh, quite overwhelming to think about all of these people with different kinds of expertise coming together but i suppose you know the 
um, things which pose ex existential threat are, are complex and you know they are multidisciplinary multi multidisciplinary so i guess it makes sense that you have to bring together all of these different kinds of people who wouldn't otherwise be talking to each other um, and yeah i think i think like that's that's you know quite a beautiful thought um, because often uh, you know departments at universities are really stratified and you know um, like cognitive science in psychology doesn't want to talk to philosophy of mind and you know they resent each other um, and at least that's what it's like at my university maybe it's different at, at Cambridge but um, uh, yeah so I think I'm, I'm glad to hear that you know there is um, conversation between between lots of different disciplines that that gives me hope for you know the future of academia as being <laughs> a more uh, yeah cohesive narrative rather than all of these disjointed things um okay so i suppose uh we could we can begin our discussion of existential risk with a question that i can ask you which is um what are you concerned about at the moment that's uh that's a good question particularly because i would have given you a very different answer um prior to COVID-19. Um, and uh, the timing of it, I don't, want, I don't know if, it, if you would say it was fortunate or unfortunate, but I became a father uh, about a week before the UK went into lockdown. And so the, well, we were, me personally and a few uh, other colleagues, we were kind of tracking what was going on with the pandemic. Um, I, can't, I wouldn't say we were only kind of wall footing in January and February, we were kind of maybe getting a bit more information that, than uh, an average citizen would. We weren't really kind of taking a step back to rethink everything. Uh, but then both being on parental leave for three months and everyone being on lockdown for you know, uh, three coming up to four months, really forced me to take a step back and think, you know, what do we think about everything we do with existential risk? And it took me back to a maxim that I had, I think, when I applied, I gave a talk in my interview to see whether they, they wanted me to be a postdoc at the center. They wanted me to give a quick talk, seven minutes or something like that. Uh, and in the talk, I said that there are three steps that you have to do if you want to be an effective existential risk research center. Um, you need to find out what's gonna kill you. You need to find out how to stop it. And then you need to implement those strategies that would actually be necessary to stop the thing from killing you. Um, and when I came, I, I mean, I've just come from spending a year in industry and I felt that that third part was very weak for academia. Know, getting their ideas out there in the world and making sure that people don't just notice them, but actually take them on board and change their behavior based on that was something that we're not particularly good at. And then I kind of forgot that because I got stuck into lots and lots of projects and convening lots of discussions about how can machine learning help us solve climate change, lots of other things. Um, it was at the back of my mind, but I think it seems Time will tell, but it seems that in the case of the response to COVID-19, implementation was the biggest failure point. In many places around the world, like pandemics is, are not a new concept. Coronavirus are not a new concept. The idea that they could be highly infectious or they could move from animals to humans, that they could move from animals to humans in wet markets. Right? None of these are new ideas. Um, how they might spread globally, not new. We have models, they're fairly good models how we might respond to them, uh, not new. We exercise those things at government levels. Uh, the UK was meant to be one of the countries that are best in the world at pandemic preparedness. It has been top of their national risk register. And the fact they even have a national risk register that they take fairly seriously, suggests that not only did we knew what was going to kill us and knew what we should do about it, and yet the response has not been uniformly good and like, the argument that we could have done a lot better is that some countries have done a lot better, including, including countries that have been fairly close to the epicenter of the pandemic. 
Um, and well, some of it might be down to um, culture or weather or, 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 or uh, previous exposure to pandemics. I mean, we don't know yet. I think it's, it's very easy to jump to conclusions and to, to explain what's going on with your pet theory, whether it's uh, ideologically tinted or scientifically tinted. I think it's going to take a while before we're going to figure out everything. But it seems that implementing um, risk mitigation is something that approaches very poor at still. Um, and, and we wrote a, a paper, it was one of the early projects that I was involved in in the center, try to look at kind of how do you classify these risk scenarios. And one of the axes that we actually didn't emphasize particularly in the paper was all of the ways we could fail to implement. And it's about individuals and their cognitive biases and their failures to coordinate with each other or not having enough skills, going up to institutions, not having enough budgets, having institutional capture, not having the right uh, codes of conduct, not having um, the right networks, going up to the mix of institutions in the world. Maybe each, in, maybe each institution is super efficient and all of the people in it are, are great at thinking about the world and have perfect epistemics, but nonetheless, we just don't have the right institutions that we need to solve the problem. So there are all of these levels where we can see failings and I think a lot of that was theoretical. We had to kind of imagine scaling up from disasters that we've seen in the world. Like we've seen Fukushima and the failings there. We've seen kind of, we can go all the way back to, to the 1918 um, Spanish flu. We can see other cases where complex um, natural technological, social technological and other issues became disasters and they exposed some failings that we can start analyzing and thinking about how we might do better. But I think COVID kind of swept through and exposes kind of a whole layer of failings at the individual, institutional and super institutional level. And so I'm very concerned that, I mean, the, the positive side is we now have the data to do better. Mm. My worry is that it's, it will take a lot of time to do this well. And I think people are gonna try and go for early fixes. It's like, oh, we've had a pandemic. We now need to build back better and kind of make all of the changes in the world that we can in the next year or two or three. I think that will be too soon and many attempts will fail. And when they fail, people are going to lose enthusiasm and go and do something else. I think it's more of a decade long project, uh, though. I mean, my thinking about is liable to change when we really started looking, digging into this seriously. Mm. Um, but I think there is maybe a once in a century opportunity to really shape up our institutions to be better at risk mitigation. And I'm very concerned that we're gonna miss it. Um, to the point that while I've done most of my work on artificial intelligence and risks in the very techie domain, um, for the next few months, I'm trying to pivot to thinking much more about the institutional response to uh, COVID and how do we set up our center to really kind of buckle in for the long haul to try and do get the learnings from, from this um, catastrophe? And then I imagine if, if we do that well, there will also be positive lessons for AI governance uh, and, and for nuclear governance and for climate change governance and for all of those other risks where, I mean, with pandemics, we got the what's gonna kill us and what we should do about it down to a T almost. With AI, we're not there, right? With climate change, mm. we're almost there. Uh, some, some would say we're totally there. Um, with nuclear, we used to be there and maybe we're not there anymore because the world is changing around those weapons. Um, but regardless of where, of where you are with the first two stages, if you're bad at the third stage, you're going to be bad at the third stage for every risk. And so I think that that's something that I'm now much more concerned about. Okay. Um, Okay, so there are a number of things that, number of questions that I have um, after that. I suppose, yeah, I think, I think one thing that is, one thing that's been, so b before we started um, talking, you asked me, or you said it would be interesting to hear what it's been like in Australia on the ground. Um, yep. And I guess what's interesting is that I was actually, I was studying at UCL until March and mm -hmm. I had to come back. Um, and so I kind of saw, I kind of saw two different cultural responses to 
the virus or two different cultural responses to the limitations that governments were trying to place on you know their citizens to control the virus um, and you know Australian culture is very well it's it's based on anglo culture you know where we are a colony um or a former colony a penal colony um and so there are lots of similarities in the ways australians think about you know risks and um threats and having their freedom limited that is probably uh that is probably a product of you know uh british colonial the british colonial regime um but there is something there is a part of australian culture which is quite it's a stereotype but it's also quite accurate and that is this kind of careless carelessness this kind of um you know oh it's going to be okay like don't worry about it it's fine things will sort um things will sort itself out things will sort themselves out um and what's interesting is that that hasn't really been the response of either the australian government or the australian i'm in melbourne so i only have i've only seen a very small pocket of how people have responded but you know we didn't have the the herd immunity kind of motivation that the johnson government had um you know the australian federal government kind of very quickly tried to close the borders and they very quickly started placing everyone who was coming into the country into hotels for a two week quarantine period and at the moment um melbourne is in second lockdown um and it's the only city in australia which is having a second lockdown um and you know relative to the uk we have and uh, you know relative to america we have a very very small number of cases um and yeah i think i think what what's interesting is that um it seems like what is dominating conversation and what is dominating politics is trying to identify one reason why things have gone wrong which is what you were talking about before um it doesn't really seem like there is any it doesn't really seem like there is any discussion of risk mitigation in the future or of any strategy being implemented longer term that's actually being discussed by anyone who isn't you know maybe i don't know behind closed doors at an equivalent center for existential risk in australia if there is one i don't think there is one um and so yeah i guess a question that i i have for you is you said that one thing when you when you went for your interview at the center you spoke about three things one identifying the threats um two i've forgotten but three how, what can we implement in order to prevent these things from happening um or to you know mitigate the risk or to be sufficiently prepared and i don't know if if that if the third limb what we can do is is really being spoken about very much because i feel like at the still in australia things are very reactive so there is a there was a surge of cases in melbourne um you know it kind of went from 2 3 4 5 new cases per day to around 100 and then once it got to about the 100 mark the city went into lockdown again and now it's climbed to about 300 but that's it that's all that's that's all that's really being spoken about this and the i guess the narrative that i have understood is that the government is just going to be reactive again and again and again it's going to be waiting for either a vaccine or it's going to be waiting for um yeah for you know cases to kind of surge and then it's going to go into lockdown again so yeah i i guess what what do you think institutions how do you think institutions need to change you know maybe over the course of a decade i'm not sure if that's a fair question but how do you think institutions need to change 
in order to accommodate things like uh, pandemics. <laughs> so of course, I'm not going to be able to, to answer for a whole decade, but 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 yeah. let, let's take it in kind of expanding circles, right? Okay. So, so you can start with where you are right now, uh, the situation you described, and you say, okay, how do I go from being? Well, first of all, you you, you need to say, are you being reactive? <laughs> in an irrational optimal way do you have enough information on the ground are you getting are you doing enough tests are you doing um enough uh, contact tracing are you doing enough um interviews taking into account the lag in all of this um information and and you know that it, it is not perfectly accurate and do you make good decisions based on that right? that's that's kind of basic minimum right can you do reaction well uh, take information from the world, act on it in an optimal way. The next step is you say, okay, I can play out what's going to happen if this is what I'm going to do, which is I'm going to have cycles of lockdown and too rapid release. Uh, and that has a much higher death toll than if I do gradual release um, with social distancing. So how do I implement a plan of gradual release from where we are now, where we have some fatigue and we have some loss of trust, but also where people are much more sensitized to the risk and the fact that they need to do something about it. Uh, yeah. How do we promote mask wearing? How do we prioritize businesses to open? How do we get people to accept that it, it is in their interest that their um, business is going to open two weeks after another set of businesses other than at the same time, because that gives us the bandwidth to see whether things are, are escalating too fast and then causing a, a winding down. Um, but these are not very hard things to communicate. I mean, saying, you know, this is an exponent and you have to be very careful because if you keep it below a threshold, then you're fine. With if you go above the threshold, it's going to go bad very quickly and you might not know about it until it's too late. And then you have to slam the handle down again. Um, I think Angela Merkel has communicated that to the German public quite well. So it's not beyond the pale that a politician would be able to communicate this in a, trust, in a trusted manner. That's for now, right? And, and now we're going to expand that cycle a little bit more, but we're going to stay within this particular case. We're going to ask, what did you have to do a year ago, two years ago, three years ago to be well prepared for this particular crisis? Did you have enough um, PPE in your hospitals? Did you run simulations of what a pandemic would look like? Uh, did you run the economic costing of various lockdown measures? Um, did you communicate to the public that this is a plausible threat and this is what you might want to do in that situation. Um, if you didn't want to scale them because it was already too much on the plate, did you prepare the communication materials so that when you are in a situation, you can very quickly communicate to everyone and you have kind of stress tested the message to know that you're hitting all of your very diverse population, uh, your pluralist population, which is something that you pride on, but that does mean that you can't just send out one message and expect everyone to act on it in the same way. Um, particularly if you need everyone to follow a particular kind of action, right? It's not just your centralized institution doing something, but you need everyone to wear a mask. How do you get to a point where you get everyone to wear a mask? How do you phrase it narrative? How do you try it out? How do you make sure that you have a trusted brand, right? That your communications mm. are sufficiently reliable that people know that they have good experience with you as a provider of healthcare, as a provider in disaster situations, so that they do uh, what you tell them, or that they go and kind of challenge you and you can give them enough answers so that to assuage their concerns. When it's good if the populace has some critical capacity to question what the government says, but the government in a time of crisis should be able to say, yes, you're right to have that, but also we really need to do this right now. This is the reason. Um, so these are all things that you could have done before the fact to deal with this particular crisis. And I think this is why I think implementation rather than risk identification or uh, mitigation identification is the failure point because at least I know that in the UK case, there have been numerous exercises and reports that said we need more PPE. Uh, mm. But instead of the number of PPE going up, it went down over the decade prior to this. Uh, and it, this is local concerns about, I mean, this, there's this giant hole full of old equipment that I don't, intend to use and I can sell it because I'm under financial pressures anyway and it means you know more hospitals bad today I mean it's a value trade-off that if you don't have good risk communication and sensitization is a sensible thing for 
someone to do in a local situation, even if you don't take corruption into this. And I don't know if there was corruption or not, but one can hypo hypothesize. Um, but, but even if you, take, if you don't take that, just take local incentives for everyone, taking the best action, and you would do the same in their situation, you end up in a society that's not prepared for risk. Hmm. Now I'm going to expand it further. I'm going to say, okay, now that we're going to learn from this, we're going to have amazing preparedness for coronavirus pandemics. Are we going to have the same for flus? Are we going to have the same for um, outbreaks of bacteria that are now coming back because they are resistant to antibiotics? Are we going to be resistant to um, bioattacks? Are bioattacks uh, more likely because people have a very recent memory of the devastating effect of a pandemic? And is that appealing to anyone? That do we need to reassess our uh, threat actors? And what do we do about them? Uh, would it play out differently from how we respond to pandemics? So far with health. Uh, the, the, we haven't even begun talking about similar effects, but the effect agriculture or effect livestock that might also have very large uh, devastating effects. Say we're amazing in pandemic preparedness. Are we prepared for the next solar flow? Uh, are we prepared for uh, accidental escalation of nuclear tensions? Are we prepared for climate change? Right? Are we going to redirect all of our disaster mitigation just to pandemics and neglect all of these other big issues um, that, as I said, I think COVID was on the smaller scale of the issues that we have facing us in 2020. Um, it's just very salient. And how do you deal with the fact that you have one risk that is super salient and all of these other risks that you're already struggling kind of very much to get them on the agenda for politicians? Um, and that's going to be even harder, arguably. So these are kind of bigger and bigger circles of why I think this is a decade long problem because you build it bit by bit. Right. Um, okay, this, this question is a little bit. Um uh left field but do you do you think that as a species we are not especially good at thinking about potential risks in the future and actually doing things about them like why why is it that you know with with so much evidence showing why we should change for example our attitude toward meat consumption or towards, um, you know, allowing, uh, you know, coal and mining companies to expand their horizons. Why is it that we're still consuming in the way that we do? Um, do you think is there like a a? Do you think there's do you think there's any kind of justification for the slowness in our preparedness for things like because we're obviously not at that third stage. We're not even close to the point where you know the focus can shift at least in australia we're not even close to at least i don't have faith in in the government moving from the coronavirus to preparing for solar flares or to preparing for you know we have we like uh seven years ago um our labor government introduce the carbon tax and that's since been scrapped so you know like and we have a conservative government um uh in power at the moment who aren't you know who are in denial about um you know the the existential threat posed by climate change so i don't know like do you think there is a reason why we're not at, at that third stage it's there are many, many things to say here. I'm going to start with one. Uh, okay. But, I mean, it can take out all, all of our time. But, but there's one that's very salient to me because there is a report we are trying to finish. And we're calling that report epistemic security. And what we say there is for a society, and particularly a affluent, technology rich, liberal democracy. Um, to make good collective, informed collective action and informed collective decision making, right? Because by democracy, you have said that you have devolved decision making to the populace. By affluent, you are saying some things about the resources of each individual to access information. By tech rich, you're saying something about how much information there is out there. Why is it that we have so much information coming into our system, right? We have 
more sensors, more capacity to process information very large scale than ever before. Why do we see failures of collective, um, failures of collective action, failures of collective decision making? And we hypothesize this concept that we call epistemic security. I think other pe people have, may have referred to it as sense making. Some people call it democratic capacity. The democratic capacity is much richer than just that. Uh, it is effectively applied social epistemology uh, in a very large scale. But, but we're taking it to, to the risk uh, arena and we're saying, so it seems that our societies are not epistemically secure in the sense that you can guarantee that true information is gonna emerge from the world, propagate to all decision-making nodes, and then bracketing out the very huge chunk of clashing values, um, they will then come to an agreement that is good for everyone. And even with clashing values, like democracy and other deliberative methods are meant to address the fact that, you know, there is one reality, numerous preferences about that reality, and we come to some agreed uh, conclusion about it. That doesn't seem to be the game we're playing. The game we're playing is that groups are disagreeing about what reality is like uh, mm. in some very deep ways. Uh, and then we ask, why is that? I mean, the, the answer is it's really complicated. It's a very, very complex system. Um, we can point at the fact that it has changed a lot in a relatively quick time. So if, if you just look at the, never mind the individuals, look at the plumbing, look at where they get information from, who produces information for that community is right. I mean, we've seen a very major shift uh, to the internet first and foremost, and then to an internet in which uh, it's a very many, to, like several billion people are actively talking to the rest of the several billion people. Um, that's very low governance, and there is a lot of algorithmic intervention, there is like synthetic data around. Um, and then you can start talking, okay, what is the role of malicious actors in this, right? How much is this kind of state propaganda or disinformation campaigns by corporations who don't want to pay their taxes, um, or just groups that have very particular ideologies and they want to kind of push that? How much is it um, communities and identity, right? The fact that we form a community and being part of the community means that we hold certain beliefs. Uh, and from that point onwards, uh, we will not let any other belief come in because they challenge the identity of our group. How much of it is trust? Uh, maybe before we had one trusted source because there was a scarcity of, of sources, but now I have many sources so I can pick and choose which sources I trust. And the way I choose them might not be related to how trustworthy they in fact are. Um, and there are a few other kind of big picture concerns that you might think through. The, the upshot of all of this is the situation is, looks very difficult and not easily solvable. I mean, the first thing that you do once you, once you look at all of this is, um, are there some quick fixes I can apply? Can I just shut down some services or roll out some laws uh, or give some education it's going to make everything better instantaneously. And the answer is almost always no. If you try to do any of these things, you're going to make things worse. Uh, you're going to lose trust in the institution that's trying to implement it. The people on the other side are going to walk around whatever you're trying to do very quickly. Um, because I'm not, these are not easy systems to analyze. Um, but uh, I think really since 2016, a lot of, um, say, left leaning academics in a wide range of fields started waking up to the idea that those systems are broken to a level that they never considered before. And so people from psychology to political theory to epistemology um, are waking up and saying, we need to think about this better. And so I think there is, there is hope um, that we start coming up with good solutions that come from complexity sciences, that come from applied epistemology, that come from media studies, that come from understanding the business logic of a few of these things. I also think that's a fairly long process. Um, without much, so, so let me put this very quickly, and that's not something I'm super confident about. Uh, so people can definitely challenge me on this following thing, but there is a particular kind of political leader uh, and there's it, a clustering of kind of, I'm gonna put Trump and Netanyahu and Johnson um, and Erdogan and Duterte and Orban. I mean, there, there's now enough of them that they are no longer exceptions, they are the type. 
And I think by, by the time you, you start seeing that there is a type, you're, you might say there is something about the underlying dynamic that makes this type more uh, evolutionary fit for this particular new environment that we have. And so the, some of the argument is saying our media, information, political environment has changed such that this type is favored. I also think that it favors um, Jacinda Ardern's. And that makes me very hopeful. I think she, she is also not an exception, but a type. Uh, my hope is that, is that in the long run, that type is more fit uh, because it is better for the ecosystem. Right? It, it, it handles risk in a better way. It, it keeps better track of the, it keeps better track both of reality and of disagreements within the population. Uh, and really, those are the only two hard things in, in the world, right? Reality and other people. Uh, if you can manage both of these well, you're going to thrive. Uh, I think it, it, takes, it, it takes a longer lead. I think it's much easier to be a Trump than another. Um, but I think once we start having lots of people thinking very carefully about how, what kind of information ecosystem we want, um, then we can end up in a world where it is very difficult for corporations to run a... Uh, doubt campaign around the impacts of the pollution, um, where it's very difficult for populists to be divisive. Uh, at least it, it will be very hard for them to play up false dichotomies in the population. They might still mm -hmm. be able to play up real dichotomies in the population, and sometimes real dichotomies in the population need to be played out, they, they need to be politically addressed. Uh, but it will be hard to stoke up non-existent ones or to continuously change which one you're stoking up so that you're never dealing with real problems. Um, I don't think that's beyond the pale of what we can do. I think we have done so much re-engineering of our information ecosystem over the last three decades, we can do a whole lot more. I think we're gonna do a whole lot more either way uh, because we can technologically, which scares, a lot, scares me a lot. Um, but I think if we do it well, we can end up in a, in a much better place. The question is whether yeah. we do it fast enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I um, I actually don't think that too many people would challenge you on that um, that binary of the two different types of leaders. I think that's actually a really um, yeah. I, th I think you've touched on something there that many people are thinking about. Um, you know what what is that certain type? What does it mean for that certain type of leader to be elected? You know the Trump. The Johnson, and on the other hand, what does it mean for a Jacinda Ardern type leader to be elected? Um, because, yeah, you know, um, with with the shift to people being informed over the internet, um, I guess the consequence of things being on the internet in a democracy that doesn't censor what's available means that, irrespective of whether you're in New Zealand or whether you're in America, you're not, you're, you shouldn't be able to be presented with a radically different, you know, uh, a radically different set of information from different types of media. But that obviously isn't really the case. You know, we have targeted advertising, we have, um, yeah, I suppose that's probably one of the biggest things, you know, the whole Cambridge Analytica uh, Facebook scandal with, you know, targeted advertising smears of um, politicians and uh, the buying of information by private companies um, and the consequent forming of ad campaigns to influence political opinion. So, yeah. Um, but I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty terrified by, um, because, you know, I, like, I don't believe that there is, um, like, I don't, I like there are as with as with the question that I asked you before, you know, what is the reason for um, people being very slow at um, implementing the necessary changes to avoid the risks? Um, I could ask you the same question about, you know, what is it about people that positions them to elect a leader of the first type like Trump or Johnson? Versus what is it about people that positions them to elect a Jacinda Ardern type leader? And, you know, like, yeah, there, there's just, like, it's so, it's so overwhelming trying to 
Um, at least I find it so overwhelming trying to piece together a coherent narrative for explaining how those kinds of things can happen. But yeah, I suppose one thing that you said that I that really resonated with me was, um, you know, we have totally reshaped so many different horizons over the past three decades, I suppose, you know, we have, um, you know, economics has changed, um, academia has changed, healthcare has changed, um, politics has changed, all of these things can change, and we have the power to change them. Um, so, you know, on one hand, I'm hopeful that, well, yeah, on one hand, it's foolish to think that it's impossible for us to ever get to that third tier that you were talking about, where we have optimum preparedness for risks. Um, but yeah, I suppose, um, yeah, I, I am, when I start thinking about the, the way that, like, yeah, when I start thinking about what I can do, um, I, I feel this kind of hopelessness, um, kind of like an, you know, an existential hopelessness that we are too far gone or that, um, you know, it's just, it, it's like, it'll be a lot of trial and error. And I guess my fear is that we don't have that much time to do trial and error, political trial and error. You know, we don't have, how many more Trumps can we have before, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, how many, how many more Erdogan's can we have, um, before things go horribly wrong? Um, okay. So yeah, maybe, maybe I think, I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground on the, the topic of the existential risk of pandemic. So maybe we can shift to, um, another genre of existential risk. So. Um, hold on. I think my blind is, there's light shining in a stranger. Give me one second. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. So the first thing I asked you, your reply was that, um, oh, you, the first thing you said, so the first question I said, what are you concerned about at the moment? And you said over the past, you know, if you asked me a few months ago, it would have been very different. So what were you concerned about before the pandemic? Yeah, so for a good chunk of my time at Caesar, I would say all of the time and very seriously for the for the last three, three and a half years, I'll be looking at risks from artificial intelligence. Um, I'll give it. I'll give a mini. I mean, I know my answers are long anyway, but th this one is, is, go, is going to be, be, be long. But I mean, feel free to, to, to interject at any point. But it's kind of. Um, I think it's good to kind of break down the the space of AI risk because I think there are there is a lot there, and it's very easy to confuse the different types. Um, and th this is not a breakdown that I would have could have come up with at the beginning, but I think it's one that I'm very comfortable with now. Uh, I like to think of them as kind of now risks, things that AI systems are already doing right now um, that uh, either are harms or are potential harms. Near term, uh, which it's not a great category, but it's roughly systems we can kind of imagine how we might build them. Okay. Uh, where there is, well, like if you if you pick a top machine learning researcher and you say, you know. Would it be possible to build a system that does X? Uh, could you roughly sketch out how you would do it? And like, yeah, sure, you would probably need to do this and this and that. Um, which in some cases mean it's 20 years from deployment. But in some cases, it means it's two years from deployment. Uh, kind of how hard it is to get the data and the funding and, the, and so on and so on. And then long term are things that we have good in principle arguments that we will one day be able to make machines that do X. Uh, but we don't even know where we would start. Right? We don't even have, uh, theoretical machine learning has not gone far enough to even begin to answer the question of how we might do this in code. Um, mm. But if you're a physicalist about the brain, um, if you kind of see various trends in other, other intelligent uh, beings, animals and so on, then there's like, yes, one day we will be able to make machines that do this thing. 
that have these properties, um, that have problem solving capacities across these environments in this lab. So with this separation, then you might ask, what are accident risk? What are, these systems are not doing what we wanted them to do and bad things happen. What are malicious risks? Uh, there are bad people out there who are trying to harm other people and now they have access to those kinds of systems. And systemic risks, where the systems are roughly doing what they want and the users are roughly behaving as we would expect them, but the interaction of many, many users with these systems create harms that will we you know, should foresee if we don't foresee and prevent, it's gonna be, it could go quite badly. Um, you could argue that, so, so for example, Cambridge Analytica type targeting would be the second, the, it would be a now risk and a malicious use, right? You're actively trying to manipulate people. You could say that the formation of insular communities um, that can, can easily find each other uh, by preferences and then once they are in those groups, uh, ban everyone who don't think like them, and the formation of echo chambers is not malicious. It's not really accidental, it's systemic. The system is doing for every individual what it's meant to do, but it's creating mm -hmm. a harm at, for the uh, epistemic system in the society. The big buzz in existential risk research, at least circa 2015, 2016, was long-term accidents. What if we make machines that are much smarter than us? Uh, they don't want what we want. They shape the world to be what they want. We, are, we end up dead in the process. Um, and when I've done a little bit of work on that space, trying to kind of clarify it and understand how what might we end there, what is the path from here to there, um, what is meaningful research that can be done on it. Uh, there are people who are much better qualified to talk about that stuff. Um, we identified on 2017 that there is a gap in the market for talking about near-term malicious risks. So not just the stuff that we have now, but the stuff we might have in five years' time. Okay. Uh, much more targeting, much more manipulation. And then that branched out into some of the work that I just talked about you know, on epistemic security. It also led to some work around machine learning in defense, and particularly machine learning around nu nuclear weapon systems. Um, if you uh, have difficulty failing to fall asleep, then I can tell you much more about those scenarios. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, and another thing that became apparent is we can come up with these risks, but we are very bad at situating them in the bigger world, right? So mm. you might have, um, I don't know, very convincing chatbots um, that masquerade as people, but you want to think about that at the same time as you have um, various culture wars and a very strong desire to bring people together to agree action about climate change. Uh, and different corporations in different parts of the world fighting for market share and different regulatory regimes. Like all of that extra detail changes how you think about the risks and what you should do about them. And so that led me to uh, much more into the direction of participatory, participatory foresight, where I try to get people to role play those futures uh, from the position of powerful actors mm. to really try and flesh out, you know, all of these interesting futures um, kind of to help me and them think about what should be done. Hmm. Okay. Um, hmm. So, so, so where do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I suppose, um, I, I think I'm, I think one thing, okay, maybe, maybe we can, maybe, because I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing about, um, the threat of nuclear risk. Um, because I feel like I feel like that's something that isn't really being spoken about too much. Um, apart from like, oh, like you know, Trump's got access to the nuclear codes. We can't trust that guy. I feel like really that's the only thing that people that I, that I hear spoken about. So maybe we can get to that in a little bit. But um, I guess so. So in terms of short near term risks, um, what? What have you, what have you identified as being, um, you know, a a very pressing thing that we need to address? 
such as, you know, you mentioned Cambridge Analytica. Is it that kind of, um, you know, is it big data collection that is, you know, something that you've been thinking about? Um, yeah, so, so we, we've looked at three main domains. Um, okay. Of concern the, the the one that we've talked that I have talked about a little bit is, is the political or the epistemic domain is the way technology yep. uh, I mean it's data and it's recommend, recommendation systems and I think uh, we haven't talked about it that much but kind of the ability to kind of generate lifelike fakes um, at scale very cheaply whenever you want ultimately so that they're indistinguishable from humans that might create as big of a shift, uh, particularly as it affects our trust and trust in testimony. Do you mean? Do you mean? Do you mean AI creating AI that is no, I, indistinguishable? So, so I mean AI creating, say, a video of me. Uh, oh, you know, oh, okay. This, this yeah. is a podcast, but yeah. I never participated, and you never participated. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And now it's used yeah. in a libel lawsuit, uh, yeah. for example. Okay. That's. I mean, those. I mean full-length video we're, we're not quite there yet um for images no i mean you can already go to the this this does this person exist uh and most people fail um to to realize which are the real images and which are the machine generated images um yeah. and you know for a very long time people said the effects are no concern the effects are no concern the effects are no concern. concern and now we're starting to see the ticking up no actually they are a concern and we don't have the legal or technical systems in place to really mm. kind of address the threat in a preemptive manner. Um, so that's the kind of political epistemic side. Then there is the um, physical. Um, and in physical, you might think of both use of AI in warfare, um, autonomous weapon systems, autonomous drones, um, but also the fact that almost, I mean, that's definitely hype. There will be many systems around the world that have small computers in them that are trying to run some cognitive services for you um, that are physical in the real world. Right? It can be your thermostat, it can be your car, uh, it can be a hospital uh, piece of equipment. If you can undermine this at scale quickly, then that's a very big vulnerability to, to society that, that wasn't there before because it didn't have those systems before. Yeah. Particularly because it's a new way of writing software and it comes with a whole new set of bugs that we don't know how to solve it. And then the, mm. the, the third one is um, the, the digital domain and, and really we're talking here about, about cyber. So this is not about the physical systems that are vulnerable because they have AI in them. This is AI can be used to find vulnerabilities in other computer systems. Um, and I mean, I think we've already seen during COVID and just before a ticking up of just how much state on state cyber warfare is going on. Uh, I mean, I think, I think there have even been uh, statements that the uh, UK grid has seen um, attacks that they've been able to thwart. Um, it seems like there are, you know, Israel and Iran are now kind of every week almost reporting that either they've been attacked by the other or accusing the, the other of attacking them, uh, or even taking pride in attacking another, which is insane if you are in a, why would you do that? But there's some deep calculus around deterrence uh, that goes on in the space that we are just not very mm -hmm. good at theorizing about. And when you have heightened conflict at machine speed that you're not very good at theorizing about, that is in a world unstable. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, because I guess like for so I know I know I'm not a software engineer and I'm not a I'm not extremely literate in um, code or in you know computers. I guess I spend a lot of time <clears throat> on computers and I have a basic. Like I probably have a, a, I think I probably have a significantly better understanding of how computers work than the lay person. Um, partly because I'm curious about how they work. Um, 
and also because I was born at a particular time and I was raised, or not, not really, I, I was born in 96. So I guess I kind of missed, like my childhood wasn't, you know, uh, based around technology and computers. But um, what, yeah. what was your first computer? Um, my first computer was a Lenovo ThinkPad that was given to me by my school in 2010. Did it have the internet on it? It did have the internet. Okay. But, but before that, my dad is really interested in technology. And when I was, when I was in primary school, he bought me an iPod touch, which also had internet connection, but mm -hmm. you know, internet in what, 2004, 2005, like it wasn't, uh, you know, all I, I think all I would do would be try, I, I think I tried to pirate some, uh, some songs that I liked. And then yeah. I think I ended up getting a virus on the iPod touch. Um, so yeah, that didn't go very far, but I guess the point of me talking about, oh, actually, okay. Okay. I have a, I have a question for you. How did, so because you worked at Google for a while. Yep. Um, how did you, like, what's been your background in tech? and computing and that kind of stuff yeah so i i mean i remember i don't actually remember the model uh because it was two models before the 286 i remember the very okay. first computer we had was you know large floppy disks one for the operating system and another for the game that you wanted to play and the monitor was green and black um i, I remember <laughs> i mean I, I remember the first internet connected computer was like four generations after that. And it was already in junior high um, that, that we got that. Um, and so, yeah, and I, I was a very geeky kid. So I was, but it was mostly video games. I, I was not interested in, in programming. I mean, some kids in school were. But then in, in the army, I got to serve in a unit that required knowledge, not just of computers, but of coding. And so they're like, Forget all the theory stuff. Here's just a very crash course on how you code computers. Go and code computers. And so I, I, and then I had to spend three and a half years doing that. And so I came out actually being a, not amazing, but okay software engineer. And I kind of stayed in that loop since. I did a short job before coming to Cambridge. And then I kind of was working with startups throughout my degrees. Um, I was always more, more interested in physics than I was in, in computer science uh, and math. Um, but it was always there, partly because I think, you know, for very simple reasons, it, it seemed very clear that it would be, all, it would be a good way of making a side income, uh, even <laughs> if I stayed in academia. Um, and then when I, went, when I went to Google, when, when they accepted me, it was like, okay, I'm a good enough software engineer, but the, the year I spent there made me a much better software engineer. Uh, it also made me realize that the vast majority of Google software engineers are very nice people who don't think a lot about the bigger uh, impacts of what they do because the vast majority of them don't work on the big products. Um, there's just, it's systems on systems on systems on systems. And if you're doing the, the systems that make compilation across distributed servers 10% more efficient, you are not thinking about biases in search. Um, yeah. I mean, you would think about them because you would talk about them in lunch, but not, not in a way that feels relevant to your personal life. Um, mm. Which, I mean, in the same way that you know that it's meaningless to say people in academia think X, uh, it really struck home with me that it is to the same extent, mean, same extent meaningless to say people at Google think X. Mm. Um, so, so, but yeah, so I've, I've been a techie uh, to some extent all my life. Uh, as with everything else I do in my life, I try to be the person with the least information about this in the room. Uh, and so I, I have friends who are way, way, very better software engineers than me and they look at my code and they throw up a little bit. Um, but, <laughs> but, but it works. Um, and, and I think that maybe it's something more general to say, but, but I mean, I, I coded a model for my PhD in philosophy of science. Um, because if you have skills, you should take them to where they are 
skulls. Uh, that's the way we're having the biggest impact. Um, and, and yeah, I think that has worked well. I mean, I mean, I'm always much more interested in the ideas around whatever the code is doing. Uh, and so when I now work with startups, that's why I try to bring in. It's like, there's a bigger world out there and that's gonna do things with your code. Let's think about that. Um, mm -hmm. But to get in the door, you need to know how to code. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I think, I think one of my resolutions this year, even though I don't very strictly adhere to them was to learn how to code. Um, and I didn't know that there is, that there's a wealth of free online coding courses from like, you know, Harvard and Yale and all of these different places. And I was so overwhelmed that I didn't even know where to begin. Um, but I kind of, you know, I did some basic, um, Python, C++, and Java stuff, um, which I've since forgotten. But yeah, so I think, I, I think, as I said before, I think my knowledge of technology and how, how it works and the, the potential threats that things pose is probably a lot more sophisticated than the lay person. Uh, I guess yours is at expert level because you know, that's your job and, um, you know, you know, you coded, you've coded, you've been, I don't know, a software engineer as a job, um, and you've received proper training. So how is, how is the lay person, I guess, yeah, does the lay person even need to be concerned with like, you know, one of the things you were saying before was that, um, you know, some, software has real life implications like a thermometer or like a breathing apparatus in a hospital or like tesla's autopilot um and i guess with the invention of these things and with the reliance of our health and well-being on them there comes the risk that if they're jeopardized the way our, our well-being and health is going to be jeopardized um, so yeah, like how, what, what can the lay person with, what can the lay person do here? Um, because I, I suppose it's, un, may, maybe it's not unrealistic today to expect everyone from now on to have a basic understanding of how software engineering works. Maybe that's not an unrealistic ask, but yeah, what do you think? Like how, how is the lay person supposed to, what are they supposed to do? Um, yeah like That's, are we just are we supposed to leave are we supposed to leave this in the hands of people like you because you know i i i trust you um and you know i trust the center you work at and i trust that you know they're asking the right questions but you know i'm really having to relinquish um i suppose yeah it feels like i'm having to relinquish a lot because really i don't have any idea what the technical i have an idea of the the ab, i have an idea of the abstract uh, yeah i have an abstract idea of the risk i know what it could look like but i don't know what it actually means for you know malware to be introduced or for there to be a ddos attack you know i don't really know what any of these things actually mean so yeah i don't know if that's actually a question but um <laughs> no it's I mean, it might not be, be a good, but it's pointing at a thing that's very real, um, which is you make a new thing, you ask lots of people to have the thing, there is risk embodied in the thing, and you don't communicate to whoever you're selling the thing to about the risk. Uh, that's a problem. Um, it's a problem because you're effectively most, move you're not owning the risk in a meaningful way. Um, we think that, uh, so, so we've argued for, for a long time, and right? it's gonna be part of the pillars of our work that you need to develop AI responsibly, meaning because you have expertise about how the system works. And by the way, I mean, you, you said that I'm an expert, but I'm not an expert because I didn't sit down and code a machine learning model. Uh, I mean, expertise is, is many, many layers. I'm at the levels where, where I can talk to experts and by asking them naive questions, get them to sufficiently explain the thing to me so I can write a report, uh, which is a good, I'm comfortable with that level. 
Um, but responsibility needs to lie with the producers of the um, tools, both to minimize the risk and to communicate honestly uh, in a way that is relevant to the users about the risks that remain that have not been eliminated. Because you cannot eliminate all risks because it's always a trade-off. Um, in a well-functioning market, this is done through a, regu a regulator um, and kind of industry standards about how you manage and communicate risks. We are not there because A, this is new and moving very rapidly and because there's a whole bunch of capture and corruption and institutional failings of the types that we have talked in the first part of the conversation. But that's where we should be. And I think, as I said, because many of the people in, in these companies generally do want to do well, they just have often don't think much about what doing well is. I think there is scope. I mean, there is scope to uh, put the pressure on, but the pressure needs to be not that you vo would voluntarily uh, mitigate and communicate about risk, but rather that you would drive for the creation of an ecosystem that checks you, right? Basically, we want a kind of auditing and verification ecosystem that enables you to have meaningful trust, uh, justified trust in the products and services that you consume. Uh, we had a report recently it's called Towards Trustworthy AI, uh, looking specifically at, at verification of claims. So when a company tells you that this thing is safe or secure or privacy preserving, what are the questions that you should be asking uh, as a layperson uh, or as a regulator to make sure that the thing is in fact what it says it does? Mm -hmm. um, that's the world that I would like to see. I think there is, there is a future trajectory where not just software, but I mean, maybe we start with AI and then apply to, to all large scale software. Um, well, it's kind of like maybe the power grid now in that everything is regulated to the eyeballs. Uh, and there are, I mean, there's not only risk controls, there are also price controls. Uh, and the mm. business models are scrutinized, not only the specific products and services are scrutinized. Um, and I mean, it's not perfect. I mean, we have created a very entrenched system that, you know, was creating a risk that at first we didn't know about and then they were hiding and now they don't want to change because they're so entrenched and, and integrated into our system. Uh, so how do you design a system of regulation that is good and adaptive, including to unknown risks is, is hard. It's a very hard question. But it's probably better than no regulation at all. Uh, mm. the, the, the other extreme is you say there are no big players uh, and everyone gets to build their own thing in their garage. Uh, and everyone's going to be educated and everyone's going to be a hacker and the world will be amazing. I am super skeptical about that. I don't think people have enough time. And I worry that we have very strong entrenched players uh, and there are economies of scale uh, that suggest that going to a world where the responsibility, I mean, you should have some responsibility to understand the world that you live in. But the responsibility is kept but by how complex the world is, right? Mm. Is, you also need to go through life and enjoy it. Uh, mm. You have some responsibility to do that as well. And be kind to other people and go as a person and, and discover all that is great and amazing about this world before you die. Um, reading about DDoS is kind of not top on the list when you take all of these other things into consideration. And so it should be the responsibility of the people who are making a system that's vulnerable to DDoS to tell you the minimum that to kind of convey to you in the most efficient way what you need to know so that you choose to engage in the service. Um, we are not in that world yet, uh, but I think that's the world we should live and that's the world we can. I think as a layperson, the one thing that you should know is that that's the world you should demand. It's mm. like, this is, what I, this is what I deserve and you haven't done this yet, so fix it. Um, mm. That's... That's the baseline, is to say, well, software in general, and I think AI in particular, is significantly failing its customers in both mitigating risks and honestly communicating about risks and creating the ecosystem that can handle both of these things. Mm. Mm. And they get yeah, a bit of right. a pass because they're young, but not forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I think, I think that one of the things that you said really, like, I just, I have all of these memories and even like recent ones of buying new tech. Like, for example, like I have, I have an iPhone and, um, yeah, I was like, you know, there's really, I have no, I have no idea how this, how this thing works. Um, and I have some faith in Apple because I've read some things on the New York times, which I guess is my, um, uh, newspaper or, you know, journalism reporting agency of choice. I've read some things on there about Apple, you know, kind of, um, scrambling personal information before it goes back to their servers. If you use, you know, their Apple maps or whatever. Um, and you know, it's different with companies like Huawei who, you know, supposedly provide the, um, CCP with unregulated, oh, un, un, unadulterated and yeah, unregulated access to personal user information. Um, I guess these are, these are the two claims. This is like, you know, kind of, um, yeah, the dichotomy that I feel like is being provided by the New York times. Um, and I guess because I'm a curious person and because I'm an extremely skeptical and sometimes extremely paranoid person, I hope to actually understand what it means for something to be encrypted and for something to be, um, you know, like in this zoom call, for example, there's a little next to the record button on my end, there's something, there's a little kind of shield with a green, green shield with a tick in it. And when I hover over that, it tells me that I'm using an enhanced encryption. Like what? I don't really know what that means, but you know, I've been told that encrypted um, messaging is a good thing. And I, I guess I, I haven't really felt as though it's been necessary for me to try and understand what that means. Um, but that being said, I think I am, I think I have enough free time for my responsibility to understand the world around me to be greater than that of someone who has less free time. Um, and that's probably not a fair thing. Um, it's, part, it's not fair on a number of levels, partly because, you know, my moral framework, if it was to be kind of, if a world was to be extrapolated from it, it wouldn't be a world where people are so tied down by work that they don't have a lot of free time. But at the same time, I don't really know what the relationship there means with people's responsibilities to understand the world around them. But yeah, I suppose like, I don't know. I'm just, um, I, I, I agree with you when you, when you set out that path of, or when you set out that kind of landscape of what, um, of what an ideal or what, you know, a good society should look like that we should advocate for one where there is government right over there is regulation of you know what it means when apple tells me that you know this is a safe phone that's mostly impervious to threats and that you know they don't they're not going to harvest my personal information and sell it to companies which are then going to give me targeted ads and take all of my money um like sure like you know it's one thing for a company to say that um but i guess it's a totally different thing for for there to be structures in place to ensure that that's actually the case. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't see how, like, I don't see how that isn't something that we could implement. It's definitely something that can happen. Um, you know, I guess it just takes a, uh, probably takes either a sufficiently scared population or a sufficiently educated um political leadership in order to implement something like that but here's something that will probably send a shit send a shiver down your spine australia currently doesn't have a minister for cyber security and um while you know it's maybe you could raise a question about what the 
responsibility of not what it means to have a minister representing a particular area means and whether that actually means that there's going to be funding and you know kind of greater care directed to this but two weeks ago uh australia the australian prime minister announced that we are we have been for a while um on the receiving end of one of the i think the biggest cyber attack on pretty much every branch of Australian government. Um, and, you know, it was very obvious that the, the prime minister was telling us that it was China who was doing this. Um, uh, but, you know, for, I guess, for political reasons, and there was like, you know, there was a lot of kind of satirical um, cartoons and journalism about, you know, how he was dancing around, you know, <laughs> saying the word China. Um, but, yeah, like I guess there was very little that was said about it, and and I was concerned. Be well, I was concerned for a number of reasons. Partly because, um, you know, universities, including my own, were, um, you know, ones that were targeted by this large scale cyber attack. But I I didn't even know what it meant. Like I didn't even know what it meant for a cyber attack to be taking place. And then when I heard that we didn't even have a minister for cybersecurity, which I didn't know, you know, I felt even more concerned that, you know, the, the people who are supposed to be making, you know, big decisions, um, probably, well, I don't know. I just, I, I guess one thing that we spoke about earlier was sufficiently trusting the government and sufficiently trusting the people who have expertise to be able to make the right decisions. Um, and I guess what it feels like has happened is that I don't think that I, as someone who thinks they have, you know, a more advanced form of, uh, I guess, technical understanding than the lay person, I don't feel like I, who could potentially understand some of, you know, the basics of what it means for a cyber attack to take place. I don't feel like I've even been sold the faintest image of the government being remotely competent at handling something like this. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. Um, and are you, what exactly do you do at your work when you say you like talk to tech, you know, like, deep learning programmers, machine learning programmers, and then you said you ask them naive questions and you write a report. Are you advising them for, for things that they should be thinking about? Or are you advising governments? Or are you, what's actually the, yeah. Yeah, I love the question. What do you actually do uh, is a case <laughs> question. Uh, um, yeah, I, 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 let, let's park the, the cyber security thing on the side that uh, I mean, there, there are many things to say about that, but um, what do I actually do? A big chunk of uh, what I have done over recent years, and I don't imagine that changing a lot, is find a question that's sufficiently interesting and sufficiently neglected, figure out who are the people you would need to have in the room to answer it, get them in a room, uh, call it a workshop, have some nice food, pay for the hotel bills and flights. I mean, I guess nowadays you would do it on Zoom. Um, Cost try saving, and right? make there be a good dynamic so that they trust both each other and you sufficiently to actually say what they think rather than corporate uh, agenda. Um, many of them are academics. Um, but also just get them to think creatively about the problem rather than, than come with the things that they always say. Um, and then try and see if people can congeal around both a risk assessment and some suggestion for solution. And then write a report. Well, when you write a report, you realize that you, actually, you really only covered like 5% of the thing that you actually need to cover. And so you go and read a bunch of material and you get people to feed back in with more comments. So you get them to own sections and, and write stuff as well. Uh, some, of the, some of these go better and some of these don't go very well. Um, but by and large, that has been our main mode and, and some of the biggest successes. Um, the malicious use of AI report is an example that 
fast world AI ripple dimension is, is another example, and there are others from earlier on. Um, to do that well, you also need to have a good network of people who trust you, and so you kind of need to be going to conferences and, and going to talks and kind of communicating with people over emails about drafts of their reports and so on and so on, just being an active mm. researcher in able to in the report. That, that's one big thing. Um, sometimes it's useful to have smaller things where you just, as you're thinking about a question, you, I mean, you don't have a question yet, but you've done some analytical clarification of a thing. You kind of find some concepts that are useful, so maybe you add it up as a paper or a blog, or you try it out on people in talks. Um, for my day job, between that and helping other people in the center with the work they do by feedbacking on things and, and brainstorming, that's, I think, the, the bulk of the day job. Uh, there are other things that, that fit within that that are specific projects. So I have taken on a responsibility on the um, ethics committee of the Machine Intelligence Garage, which is an uh, accelerator for AI startups in the UK. And what that looks like is that every few months when they have a cohort of new companies, um, someone else and me would go on a call with the founder, uh, maybe the founder and another, another person from the core team, and we will talk through concerns that, you know, ethical concerns that they might have about the company and its impacts. Um, and there's a very big framework that uh, a bunch of fancy people uh, came up with that I just get to use. Uh, it's actually, I like it, it's really nice. Um, so so that's, like a, that's a small thing, right? It's once every few months, but, but it's really that other direction. Or kind of go directly to practitioners, talk to them about some of the things that we've picked up. Another one is just go and give public talks. And, and podcasts mm. like this is like, Take this information, make it more available outside of policy world. Another, another is to do the same thing, but targeted at policymakers. So attend workshops, submit uh, evidence to inquiry, formal inquiries, participate in sound, sound making bodies, that kind of stuff. Um, and then because I'm me and I like doing things that are a bit unorthodox, I'll always try to have the wheel project on the side. So a couple of years back, um, we got got some money and did a project on creating a mod for Civilization V, where the, instead of the science victory being you go to Alpha Star, in the science victory is you create an aligned superintelligence and everything is good forever. But of course, if you don't invest enough in safety, then things can go horribly wrong and everyone will die. Uh, and just Whoa. to see what that will look like. Um, mm. And I guess on a similar theme, in the last couple of years, uh, with in fact a growing to team of really nice uh, people and some funding, We've been developing kind of a role play game uh, where you kind of play the CEO of Google or, or uh, head of the CCP and, and you try and make decisions about the future of AI. Um, I mean, playing games is, is fun, and if you can use them for research, that's even more fun. But yeah. <laughs> the, the bulk of the thing is, you know, there's the few months of preparing the workshop, then a couple of days of actually doing the workshop, and then maybe a year of collating all of that information, kind of the seeds from the workshop and all of the other stuff that you need to actually have a meaningful report, that's most mm. of the time. And emails. Mm. And emails, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, wow, I mean, that, that is an extraordinary amount of things to do. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm totally envious of your capacity to have a conversation like this at 12.33 a.m., <laughs> in, in, are, you, are you in Cambridge at the moment? Uh, I'm in London. Uh, my oh, you're wife in London. Okay. Is in London, and he, I mean, used to need need to be in the office more, so we live in London. But uh, I mean, I'm a night person. I go to sleep. Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, I think from the very early on, I thought that talking about what I do is, I mean, it's both good for me because it helps me kind of figure out what I actually think about some things and and whether. Hmm. I can communicate about them clearly, uh, mm. which is challenging for academics. <laughs> um, but also there is a responsibility to do so. Right? It's, there is no point me thinking about the things that are gonna kill everyone if no one other than me knows about them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean that, and like that is part of the reason why I decided to make this podcast because I realized that there was so much being said that was so important that wasn't leaving the institution um, and I hoped to try and yeah I don't know bridge bridge that gap um, 
and yeah, it's hard. Like it's hard to, uh, it's kind of sad that it doesn't really seem like there is, um, yeah, maybe like, maybe our, I'm not sure if we belong to the same generation, but I'm just going to say, suppose that we do, um, <laughs> our generation, um, seems to be more literate when it comes to like the obligation of sharing because probably because, you know, like we run the risk of, um, yeah, we run the risk of like many things going wrong, um, very quickly. Um, and yeah, like that, I think, I think that's really cool. It sounds like, it sounds like you've got a really incredible job. Um, I am yeah. Really uh, yeah. 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 Um, oh, but I, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you've worked extremely hard, um, you know, to get there. Um, yeah. So I guess, I don't know. Do you think there are any gaps? Do you think there's anything that we, that we haven't spoken about or do you think there's anything? I mean, two curious people can talk endlessly. Um, yeah, I think, we, I think we've covered a good amount of ground. Um, and I mean, the, the only thing is, I don't think we found anything that we disagree on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I don't think we have. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, I will. Okay, maybe, maybe something that is, um, somewhere where we might be able to find, you know, a bit of, um, a difference in what we believe is before you were talking about physicalism. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose, um, uh, how do you feel about um, the development of an artificial mind? Um, and how do you feel about the because I'm I've recently Oh, where is it? Somewhere here? Um, I'm reading this at the moment. Ah, yeah. The, the, the and, first thing I read when I got the job, I like oh, I spent really? the first two weeks and I just got a copy of this and and went everywhere with it and read through it. Yeah, yeah. It's pro. It's one of the most dense books I've. So yeah, if for the people who aren't watching, this is um, Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom. Um, yeah, and I guess some of the things that he talks about, um, yeah, are. I guess I'm I, like the, there hasn't been too much about, he seems to kind of sweep over, at least in the first, I'm about halfway, he seems to sweep over the topic of an artificially engineered mind. Um, and maybe because maybe that comes later, but um, it seems like for him, uh, there are more, well, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, maybe, maybe he comes to it, but yeah, I guess like what I have, what I know, from my limited study of philosophy of mind is that, um, you know, you can, so there's physicalism, which is where you believe that um, uh, all that there is can be investigated by physics and science and can be measured. And, you know, there is nothing outside of the physical universe. There is nothing, nothing metaphysical. Um, there is no kind of, you know, fairy dust that's being sprinkled that gives rise to consciousness. Um, and, you know, I guess in that sense, I probably am a physicalist. I don't think that there is anything, you know, supernatural going on. Um, but at the same time, I'm really struck by the issue of consciousness potentially being an emergent property of a physical brain. So, yeah, to turn all of this into a question, one, are you a physicalist? And two, um, what, how do you feel about the development of, you know, because people like Elon Musk think that it's gonna be very possible to map out every single neuron and its responsibility. And by doing so, you know, engineering a mind and then, you know, being able to increase the bandwidth from a hundred, um meters per second of a neuron to you know optic fiber light speed stuff so um yeah how do you feel about all of that yeah um so i am a physicalist in that i don't believe in metric um i mean 
I'm open to the fact that there are phenomena we haven't discovered yet, but I think, you know, ultimately we can apply the scientific method to everything and, and we're going to make progress that way. Um, I also think that specifically in the area of kind of structures that exhibit intelligence uh, with brains being the, the epitome of that, uh, we have very good reasons to think that they are physical systems, not only that they are physical systems, that they are evolved, they were evolved in particular ways, uh, that they are not optimal, like that you can definitely do more problem solving than what the brain can do. And the, the brain is the most incredible machine around. Um, I think that's still the case. I think, I think even though we have global sized machines now, I don't think that they have local complexity or the scaling varied complexity that, that approaches the brain yet. Um, but I think that, that's a threshold that we're gonna pass. Um, and I think in some of those systems that are of that level of complexity or above, a subset will exhibit um, consciousness as an emergent phenomenon. Um, I think we're very poor at understanding what consciousness is, partly because it's kind of, we have the experience of being conscious while also observing it in others. And in those, those two are, are a bundle of properties that you, we have examples of, so we don't know if they come apart or not in interesting ways. Um, like we don't know if there are things that can look conscious, but don't in fact have that inner experience. And we don't think, I mean, we do know that there are things who have the inner experience, but don't exhibit them because we know of locked in sy syndrome. Um, but then even within consciousness, there is like, um, you know, a, a knowledge of a self and self perceptions and, and other things that maybe they can come together. Um, and, and so I kind of, the people who think about integrated information theory, well, I think there are some really weird things going on there. I mean, the fact that they're trying to kind of apply the scientific method and be more rigorous about what they mean about consciousness, I think is useful. Um, and so I think once you're in that mind space, uh, the kind of stuff that Elon Musk thinks about makes total sense, right? You can start asking about bandwidths, you can start asking about uh, capacities of problems, you can start asking about things that can or cannot instantiate consciousness, you can talk about meaningful control. Um, I think there, there is, I, I know that you're interested in kind of his Neuralink, Neuralink stuff, and I think he said in the context of Neuralink something about uh, meaningful control is constrained by bandwidth, right? So, and, and I think this is generally true and in fact applicable much more to the world of law and institutions and corporations, but it also applies uh, to brains and bodies uh, and ultimately will apply to technical systems. Um, I think there is a some vision um, of Elon that we will be able to you know, keep our meat brains, but also have enough bandwidth to control something that is operating at, at silicon speeds. Uh, the speed mismatch uh, makes it not work at face value, but he is a very smart engineer, and I'm sure that he has not only thought of that, but hired very smart people to think very carefully about that. Um, mm. But I mean, another way to, to think about this whole thing is to say there are numerous pathways to getting very you know, high levels of intelligence. Whole, whole brain emulation is one of them uh, and kind of direct high bandwidth integration with the brain is, is maybe very close to it, but not the same. Um, I for one see very fast progress on the other path, which is just have good algorithms that scale with a lot of compute and throw all the data in the world at them and get very kind of very sophisticated pattern recognition at the point that you get some generality uh, and if you put it inside an agent then you also get some agentish behavior uh, and I, I don't know if you hit consciousness on that path but you suddenly hit the kind of things that I worry about in terms of very high level of intelligence I worry that that timeline is faster. Uh, and, and there are some really weird dynamics, right? Because once you have, I mean, there is a limited, limited number of very smart engineers. They want to work on the thing that is making the most progress and where all the other, other engineers are going. And so something can be a little bit more promising and then end up being far, much farther ahead because that's where all of the people went. Um, hmm. And so I think about the sociology of research, it is just as important as thinking about what is hard or easy to solve a prior. Um, 
yeah, so I think, I don't know that we, I mean, it's just very hard to think carefully about uh, what is consciousness, what is intelligence, and to what extent we're going to see them embodied in machines. Uh, I really, if you are reading super intelligence, one thing that I would recommend reading afterwards is um, Eric Drexler's technical report called okay. the Framing Intelligence. Because he agrees with Nick on many things, but he tries to take an ax to the idea that it will have to be the intelligence, kind of a single unitary agent that is mm. engaging with the world as an agent and asks us instead to think, what if we have lots and lots and lots of fairly tight services that are very good at one thing and they're not, ag in the same way that Google Maps is not an agent, uh, it's a mm. service. Uh, but it, it is a cognitive service, right? I mean, you could imagine a human telling you how to get from a place to, to a place. Instead, you replace it with a service that is intelligent but has no consciousness or agent-like uh, behavior. What if you tile the entire world with that? If you take all of the cognitive, meaningful cognitive things that humans do, including creative ones, and you kind of just have millions of them, tens of millions of them, all combining to create a very cognitively rich world that humans engage with, but you never make agents uh, in, in the super intelligence type. Uh, because I've incredibly become to think that if, if the super intelligence world is, is closer than the, whole, than the whole brain emulation world, the comprehensive AI services world is even closer. I mean, that yeah. seems to be the thing that we're actually trying to build. Uh, yeah. you know, those corporations that are leading the research are trying to build. Um, and that might mean that we don't have to worry so much about consciousness, uh, at least in the near medium term. It's still a good thing to think about. Um, I think it will, particularly if all of this speeds up the rate at which we progress, we may be at a point where we can choose whether we want conscious machines um, in, my, in our lifetime or in my daughter's lifetime. That, that's something I think I, actually I think about quite a lot. Like, with all of the information I'm getting in, what will the future look like, not just for me, but for her? Um, and it's gonna be really weird. I think what we've seen in the last, you know, I'm gonna turn 36 this December, and we'll think what we've seen in the last 36 years, uh, including the end of the Cold War, the rise of the internet, smartphones, social media, um, populist leaders, co even COVID. Uh, I think that's, small fry compared to what we're going to see in the 36 years after. Hmm. Well, yeah, I think, I think if people, um, yeah, I think you've given me and hopefully anyone watching or listening to this, um, a lot, a lot of ways of thinking about, um, of thinking about the future and planning and, you know, thinking about who they're going to vote for and thinking about, um, what they advocate for and which kinds of conversations they have. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Shahar. I had, yeah, this this is one of the most interesting um, and probably eye-opening conversations I've had on the podcast. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate the amount of time and energy you've given me. Thank you. No, a pleasure. Um, if we have like two more minutes, could I ask you something? Yeah, yeah of course. I mean, just now, before you've had a lot of time to reflect on the whole thing, what are like one or two things that you think you're going to remember from this conversation? Um, I think I'm going to remember that it's okay not to, it's because, okay, so I guess I'm going to situate this in the context of me as an individual. So I'm mm -hmm. a, I think I'm an, ex, I'm a stubborn and ambitious person. And I think I am reluctant to, feel as though I am giving uh, authority to other people to act on my behalf. But I think after this conversation, I will feel more comfortable. Um, I, will, I will go out, I will try harder to trust people who, you know, sufficiently demonstrate that they are educated in areas where I haven't, that I'm not educated in. So I think that's one thing that sticks with me. So especially, that's why I think that the center that you work at and you know the future of humanity institute i think that's why they are so important um, because they allow people on the outside who aren't experts and who don't have 
expert level information to trust that there is, you know, there are people thinking about this who actually know what it means to think about this, um, who know the intricacies and, you know, the fine parts of all of this kind of stuff. So I think that's one thing that I've taken away from it. Um, and I think the second thing is that, um, yeah, I'm actually, I guess this has just reminded me of um, how I felt maybe 18 months ago thinking about AI. And I think, I'm not sure I've had the kind of reaction that I thought I would have to learning more about AI and existential risk and this kind of stuff. And I think before, before I really knew what was going on in the area of existential risk and in AI and in tech, I thought that the more I would learn about it, the less hopeful I would be that we were going to be able to do anything. Um, but I guess, yeah, I feel, I guess, yeah, I feel the more I learn, um, yeah, I guess it's, I guess it just, it, it felt like a very alien world to me, um, the world of, you know, making of algorithms and of this kind of stuff. But I guess it feels a lot more accessible. Um, and yeah, I think I, I feel, I think, yeah, I guess I've just, one thing that I've taken away is, another thing that I've taken away is the importance of conversations about this kind of stuff. Um, because, yeah, I think really that's one of the, one of the few things that can actually get through to people. Um, and yeah, I think I've been reminded that, you know, my curiosity should come before my uh, stubbornness. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Can I ask the same question of you? Um, yeah, yeah, you can. Um, that I give answers that are far too long. No, but, um, <laughs> but I think seriously <laughs> that, I mean, it's a very, very good reminder of how important it is to, to take time, time and do more. Um, talk to people who are not policymakers and are not engineers, just, you know, I mean, you're not the lay part. I mean, there's no such thing as a lay person anyway, uh, mm -hmm. right? But there are people outside of the circles that we usually talk to. Um, and I don't think I changed what I said very significantly from how I would talk to a policymaker. Um, hmm. And that's good. Uh, I mean, unless you completely fail to understand me, but it doesn't seem like it fails to understand me, which suggests that I'm saying useful things that, that are pitched at, at the right level. Um, and it also means that I'm being honest. Right? If hmm. I find myself saying very different things when I'm on a podcast to when I'm meeting a policymaker, I would start worrying that I'm just telling people what they want to hear. Uh, hmm. And that's that's worrying. I mean, what, what you say about trust is, is interesting because I try to, it's really, right. the scientist in me wants to say, no, you should always question things, right? And, and we also, we need that, that criticism from the outside, but, but really this, this work on epistemic security is just, there's too much stuff in the world and we have limited time. Right? We are serial processors. With, there is no life and there is no society without trust. And so you can't go down the route of no trust. You have to go down the route of how do you match trust to trustworthiness? Um, hmm. And I think, I think to me, that means if I am going to be bestowed with trust, I need to be trustworthy, right? Hmm. And it means um, it's not just, you know, making sure that the things I say are, are true and useful, but also that if someone else was in my position, uh, there is nothing that I'm, nothing major that I'm missing, right? Uh, just because I happen to um, be broadly fine with capitalism and not have massive, massive communist sentences doesn't mean that I, I have the privilege of ignoring power relations um, or, or what capital does or the effects of those things because if that framework is useful and someone else in my position would have used it, then I am not a trust, trustworthy agent if I ignore. Um, 
and yeah, I think I think a past me who didn't take that as seriously the the notion that it is really actually very important if you are doing research to do it from as many perspectives as possible. I think we would not have been able to have a conversation with, with which we agree so much. Um, hmm. And that that's good. I think that's something that I want to build on and also maybe try and communicate to people in my circles. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I think I really admire um, the, yeah, it's like, I think I, I have understood uh, a lot of what you've said. Um, yep. And I guess, um, I guess a lot of that comes down to you being a gifted communicator. Um, but it, I guess it also comes down to you um, treating someone who is outside the circle of people who you, you know, normally advise. So, you know, the policy people and the engineers and whatever. Um, so me as being someone outside of that circle, I guess, yeah, you're treating me as someone who is, oh, it, it's felt like you've been treating me as someone who is, you know, worth, and my listeners as being <clears throat> people who are worth the, <clears throat> the, um, worth the time and the energy. Um, because yeah, I guess it isn't like, you're right in saying that, um, you're right in identifying these two strands of um duty that i suppose you have you, i guess you have a duty to the institution and to your peers and to the people you work for but um i guess because the nature of your work um you know relates to everyone i guess yeah and in, in that sense you know yeah i think i think yeah you know um you have shown that you know you care um by you know taking the time to have this conversation with me and by you know i guess yeah you know being and saying that you know you haven't spoken to me in a way that was radically different from how you'd speak to other people so um yeah cool so thank cool. you for this opportunity to exercise hey. my duty uh and for being <laughs> uh, uh, th those were great questions uh i'm sorry if my answers were a little bit on the longer side but i hope thing i mean sounds like this was good I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I had a really wonderful time. Um, no, I think your answers were, yeah, extremely informative. So Shahar, thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's been great. Cool.